Uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, the next talk in this wonderful series. Uh, we thank uh, Tommy for his wonderful leadership in this area. It is uh, my pleasure. My name is Bobby Anaga. I'm a heart surgeon and division head at the uh, St. Michael's Hospital, University of Toronto. Um, uh, we have first a wonderful speaker, the chief of cardiac surgery at uh, uh, Victoria, the Jubilee uh, Hospital in Victoria, Dr. Uh, Lynn Fedorik, who is a, a master mitral valve surgeon and complex um, aortic surgeon. And uh, she is going to uh, first give us our talk about the indications and some of the preoperative uh, planning for patients with infective endocarditis. And I will follow with some surgical uh, insights and tips and pearls. So without further ado, Dr. Fedorik. All right, thanks. Uh, let's just get this show on the road here. Share screen. All right, is that good? We say it loud and clear. Good. That's always handy. I'm not. I'm not great with technology yet, even though we've been doing Zoom meetings for how many years now. So, what people um, need to know is that this project started with Corey and I at a meeting in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, two years ago, when he stood up on a stage and started to talk about the ethical considerations of cardiac surgery with respect to intravenous drug use and endocarditis and. In that meeting, there was a huge dichotomy of views, and we're gonna, hopefully Corey will join us in a bit and get onto some of this, about how to treat these patients, whether we should treat these patients, how many times we should treat these patients. And so that's sort of the process that we've been going through. And for some reason, there we go. You know, I think that, I just wanna say that, I just wanna help try and be a part of a, Canadian-wide solution to try and help us understand this com complex issue because there is no right answer. There also is no wrong answer. And so this is what makes it kind of difficult to move forward with. So with this portion, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of the surgical issues associated with infective endocarditis. So one of the things about infective endocarditis is that it is a disease that affects a multitude of people across society. There are risk factors associated with it, one of them being having a prosthetic valve in situ and, and then undergoing procedures. Another is having previous endocarditis. Congenital heart diseases with uh, flow disturbances tend to create vortexes in areas where seeding can occur. Transient bacteremias in somebody with a normal valve can actually cause endocarditis, albeit somewhat rarely, but we do see it. Uh, one of the newer ones that I've been noticing, and I don't know if anybody else has, Bobby, maybe you have or not, is, uh, is there a correlation with tattooing? I've had three people now with, that have had endocarditis and have had two tattoos within the last nine to 12 months. And it, it, it's anecdotal, but it's a question. Hard, hard to say, you know, young folks, everyone's got tattoos these days. Hard, exactly. But an interesting question, yeah. Right. And then, and then finally, and this is the, the one that we're, we're focusing on a little bit in this whole group is the intravenous, intravenous drug use population. So one of the biggest issues is, is we all know that in 2016, the opioid crisis was considered and declared an epidemic in Canada. And in, in 2020, the Annals of Thoracic Surgery took a look at the STS database and took a look at the amount of change in the last 10 years with respect to IV opioid use disorder and endocarditis. And they found that there was a profound increase in, in the rates of infection. And they found that the, the rates of reoperations went up as well. And the, interestingly enough, the STS database, of course, is not a full database. And so these numbers are probably higher than that. And interestingly enough as well, one of the things that cardiac surgery is doing better is we're actually getting these people out of the operating room in a better fashion and they're surviving. You know, 7.8% of people dying in hospitals, believe it or not, a low mortality risk for this type of procedure. In New Brunswick from 2013 to 2017, there's almost a doubling in rates of infection and endocarditis with respect to the intravenous drug use population. Two-year mean survival in this group was 62%. Average age, 38 years. That's a problem. That's just a big problem. 
Manitoba, another another study that that has demonstrated again a profound increase in the intravenous drug use population with infective endocarditis. Now, this paper from 2003 through sorry 2004 through 2018 probably has some statistical issues associated with it simply because of the fact that it, when they go back and look at 2003, they weren't collecting the data the same way, but. I don't think that 0 0.11 per 100,000 is accurate. It was probably closer to one, but regardless, it's now all almost up at three per 100,000. And I, I, in the last three years, I've hired two surgeons from, from Winnipeg and they're both, they both say, hey, we got nothing going on here relative to there. And we have a pretty large endocarditis issue with our IV drug population. So Manitoba has again shown significant issues with respect to this process. Now, you know, Prevention is the key, but that's what all of these talks have been about. And that's what this series is about. This is what Tommy's talking about is how do we move forward from this, right? But let's go back to diagnosing infective endocarditis. I'm not even gonna go through this. This is a busy slide, the Duke criteria. I mean, it's kind of like memorizing the clotting cascade over and over and over again. When you need to, you just look it up, right? But more importantly, let's go to the Coles Notes version of the diagnosis. First of all, you need a high level of suspicion. Second of all, you need positive blood cultures from peripheral sources. And third of all, you need to get an echo. And if you can't do those three things, then you can't diagnose endocarditis. But it's something that people tend to miss, unfortunately, because there's so much going on in this patient population that often by the time they come in, they're, you know, they've seen three or four doctors, they haven't been feeling well, they've got the flu, they're any, and it's not until they've got rip roaring endocarditis that we tend to see them. So if, if somebody can see them early and have a high level of suspicion, it's probably a very good thing. You know, delaying the diagnosis of endocarditis causes irreparable structural damage to the heart. That blue arrow that you're seeing there is pointing at a paravalvular abscess. You can see the dye in the aorta. I can't get my mouse to work, unfortunately, but you can see the dye in the aorta and you can see that big gray blob beside it. Well, that's all pus. And let me tell you, when you get in there and you see that, as Bobby is gonna show you, that's a problem. And that's what we're trying to prevent here. You know, the delayed diagnosis causes strokes, embolization to other areas, especially we see it in the spleen. If it's a tricuspid valve endocarditis, what you do is you see pulmonary uh, vacuoles, for lack of a better way to describe it and the need for surgical therapy increases. Now, when you're talking about indications, what you're talking about is what we need to have in order to operate on a patient. Just because they have endocarditis does not need, mean they need surgery. If there's no specific indication, then hopefully we can get away with medical therapy. So what you're seeing there in the middle of that lovely looking flower, that's a mitral valve, and that's a vegetation. That's basically what the cause is that we're going after. Now, 21% mortality of, in this group of patients with surgical therapy, 45% mortality with medical management. Risk factors that create higher mortality include altered mental status, severe heart failure, staph aureus, prosthetic valve endocarditis. Left-sided indication, or sorry, another indication is left-sided surgery. Now, what you're seeing there is the upper picture is a fungal endocarditis of a tricuspid valve that big white blob in the middle of the right ventricle where the arrow is pointing is a big fungus ball. The lower picture is actually a fungus infection in a TAVI valve. Let me tell you, that was not a fun operation. But in those cases, these, these again are surgical indications and you can appreciate why. Other surgical indications, heart block, annular or aortic abscesses. Well, again, what happens with heart block is the annular abscess actually goes down into the AV node. So as the infection gets towards the AV node, what you see is prolongation of the PR interval followed by complete heart block. And this creates destructive penetrating lesions and fistulas, which make it very difficult for patients and for the surgeons to operate on them properly. We end up doing big procedures in order to try and fill these holes reconstructing the entire heart. Another surgical indication, persistent bacteremia and fever lasting five days. That's a tough one simply because of the fact that if they have a discitis, pulmonary uh, abscesses, other causes for bacteremia, it's really hard to tease out exactly what is what. The prosthetic valve endocarditis, relapsing infections. Well, you can see from this picture, this is a 
That was an aortic valve that was pulled out and that one wouldn't be very difficult to see on an echo, but sometimes they can be a lot more subtle. Recurrent embolization, persistent vegetations. And you know, this, this is the final one that in the uh, ACC guidelines, the, um, the guideline writers stated that in patients with recurrent endocarditis and continued IV drug use, consultation with addictions medicine is recommended to discuss the long-term prognosis for patients refraining from actions that cause reinfection before repeat surgery. Pretty vague and nebulous, I would say, wouldn't you? So when you're looking at contraindications, why wouldn't we take a young person to the operating room? Well, major end organ failure, such as liver failure. Uh, I had a lady two weeks ago who was hep B, hep C positive, alcohol abuse. Her INR pre-procedure was 1.5 without any anticoagulation. We did take her, but unfortunately she did succumb to her, her liver failure. Uh, renal failure in some patients who refused dialysis. Pulmonary abscesses, you know, pulmonary abscesses in the in light of a tricuspid valve, ride them out as long as you can because they never get better and they don't do well on pump. If they have a, had a, a mycotic aneurysm and a major intracranial hemorrhage, if they've had a major ischemic stroke, delay should be approximately four weeks prior to undergoing surgery, if medically possible. Come on, next one. There we go. So this gets back to that comment that was comment that was made from uh, the ACC committee about actions that cause reinfection. Is that a contraindication if the patient states that they're going to continue to use? I don't know the answer to that, but that's an interesting question. And so what you need to do is you need to look at things from a different standpoint. Come on. And say that, you know, Opioid use disorder, it, it's a medical disorder, and it requires a multidisciplinary treat team in order to treat these people. Certainly, when the patients are sick enough that they require surgical intervention, the surgeon is, is sort of the cheerleader, the quarterback is involved in the acute situation. However, having said that, it is a team approach that is necessary to treat these patients. And, you know, I think that we just have to keep that in mind whenever we're looking at this patient population. So I'm going to turn this over to Bobby now, who's going to tell you much more about the surgical parts of this and have a much more interesting talk because he gets to use like videos and things. Thank you, Lynn. One second as I get my slides. Okay. Share screen. Okay, well, my name is Bobby Anagal. I'm the division head and the program director at the University of Toronto. I work at St. Michael's Hospital. It's a great pleasure for me to speak to you. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to share the, the podium with uh, someone who's a giant in our field, such as Dr. Fedorik uh, from Victoria. We're gonna talk about some surgery. Now, I know you, you all aren't surgeons, and so I don't wanna go into any kind of nauseating detail, but I just wanna give you a sense of what kind of things that we do in the operating room. And hopefully that'll give you a background uh, as you treat these patients. No disclosures. I'm gonna do this a brief platform introduction and then we'll just go through the valves, the aortic, the mitral, the tricuspid. We never talk about the pulmonary, never seems to get infected. And I'll give a summary. Um, so uh, you know all this, it's an infective endocarditis is an infection of the endocardium. Um, aortic and mitral are still the most commonly affected, even in IV drug users, I must say, in the tricuspid less so. Uh, tricuspid valve infective endocarditis is primarily affected in the IV drug user population, uh, injection use population. Uh, it's more staff than strep these days, about 30% need surgery. And this is a high risk population, about 30% overall mortality, no matter what you do, these patients are sick. Uh, surgical indications, as Dr. Fedorik mentioned, primarily, you know, broad strokes, heart failure, stroke embolism, large veg, abscess, or persistent infection. The principles of surgery are as follows. We're really simple. We're just heart surgeons. So remove all infected materials. Get rid of everything infected 
and then figure out how you're going to reconstruct the heart or replace the replace what you got rid of. So that that's the principle: remove everything infected, and then figure out how you're going to put the heart back together. Um, let's focus on the aortic valve. Um, on the left panel here, this is actually a prosthetic aortic valve, but it shows the veggies quite nicely. And uh, this is a fellow who had prosthetic valve infective endocarditis. The middle panel shows that this uh, patient has had patch of the uh, root um, and so had abscess cavities. And that we often see abscess you know, we are in, in, the, in the context of prosthetic valve infective endocarditis. It often goes past the valve itself. And then finally, you could see on the right panel there, replacement of that valve, a fresh uh, a bovine uh, valve. And this fellow did reasonably well. So our strategy overall, again, is to replace all the infected stuff. So if, if what's infected is the aortic valve, then simply we're talking about AVR, replacement of the valve leaflets. Now, if the infection goes into the, into the annulus in the form of an abscess cavity, then we're usually patching, I'm just gonna admit Teresa Chung there, okay? We're usually patching the root and then doing an AVR. And if the infection goes into two sinuses of Valsalva, usually we're talking about a patch. Now, sometimes the whole abscess, the whole the annulus is infected. We have complete circumferential infection. There, there's no, there's no annulus to speak of. We're usually doing a bentol, modified bentol procedure or replacing the valve, the root, and the ascending aorta. And by the way, this is quite a hard surgery because we're sewing that bentol into tissue that is not the annulus. And of course, if we have infection of the aorta mitral curtain, the aorta, the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and that connection, we may be talking about something uh, referred to as a commando procedure or an inlet outlet replacement. It's a very, very big and complex operation. So we keep it simple, replace what we need to, and we're willing to go further if we have to. Um, I just want to go through something interesting. You say, well, how about this? You know, you got this infection. Why do you put in the prosthetic material? On the right there is a conventional modified bentol. It's all prosthes prosthesis. It's plastic. It's Dacron. And on the, on the left there is what we call a homograft. It's a cadaveric valve. Now it's more biological tissue. We say, why don't you put in the biological? It's probably less likely to get reinfected. Well, we did a meta-analysis uh, several years ago and found that, in fact, that's not really the case. In reinfection, if you look at the line of equity, really no difference. We found no difference in all-cause mortality, no difference in reinfection, no difference in need for reoperation for the large part. So, you know, uh, if you get rid of the infection, and you put in a modified bentol and with a Dacron graft, you can do reasonably well. How about the mitral valve? Well, um, you don't have to be an echocardiographer to know that there's something funny about this mitral valve. This is a young, young lady I, I did. She was in fact an IV drug user and it had a massive infection of the mitral valve. Um, you, can't, you can imagine that this could not be repaired, uh, certainly had to replace this valve. Okay, so in my experience, and I could hear from Dr. Fedorik, by the time they come to us, the valves are so chewed up, they're so destroyed that I'm not even considering repair. Uh, if, you, if you're considering repair of a very isolated vegetation or a hole in the leaflet, one may put a patch, such as on the left there, but more often than not, I'm replacing the valve entirely. And I'm going to replace it with either a uh, plastic valve, which is a mechanical valve on the on the sort of that that uh, sort of bi the mechanical valve on the right there, or with a bioprosthesis. And for the large part, I'm putting in a bioprosthesis. Certainly, I would put in a bioprosthesis in any aged IV drug user, um, uh, but often I'm putting in a bio. Now, why would a, a patient with infective endocarditis get a STEMI? This is actually that same young patient. And you may uh, see here that uh, there's a loss of a vessel here. This is the LAD. This poor lady actually embolized to her coronary. It's got a massive anterior STEMI. And you can see on the right panel, there's some 
some offending little vegetation in the left LAD. So I had to bypass her as well. But, you know, sometimes this clinical story is not clear. You say, well, this is a patient with a STEMI when in fact it ends up being endocarditis. So, you know, we, the clinical picture often very, very difficult to, to really interpret what's going on. So we do what's necessary. And again, you know, if it's necessary, well, they'll do the bypass. And you know, I'll know about bypass surgery. How about the tricuspid? Um, now here's on the left, there's a tricuspid valve through the right atrium. You can see that big Goomba. Um, again, by the time they get to us, no chance in repairing the valve. I don't think I've repaired many tricuspid valve uh, valves that have endocarditis. Maybe, maybe just a handful. If there's a real small vegetation, the valve's competent, I'll just do a vegetectomy. But by and large, the valve is completely infected and I need to replace that thing. Oh, there we go. So these are our, uh, our options, valve replacement. And I usually, uh, in fact, I always put in a bioprosthesis because it re functions reasonably well on this low gradient system. Valve repair, uh, infrequent. Valvectomy, why not just cut out the whole valve, leave them with wide open TR? We used to do that, but not so much anymore. And what is this vacuum assistant thrombectomy? That's interesting. So valve replacement, yes, commonly. Valve repair, very uncommon. Just the valve is so destroyed, I can't possibly repair it. Valvectomy, mostly a historic uh, procedure, uh, not commonly done. I, I think it's too cruel to leave someone with wide open TR. I just don't think that's a good thing. And uh, valve assisted thrombectomy. So, aha, uh -huh, interesting. There's something called an angiovac. It's basically kind of a, a Hoover vacuum cleaner on a, on a wire there. You can see the, um, that this thing is sort of high pressure and you can just suck up a vegetation and it gets caught in this, uh, this uh, chamber here. So it, you could imagine a young IV drug user, for instance, with a reasonably competent tricuspid valve with a huge vegetation. You suck up the vegetation, leave a little bit of bits in there, which the antibiotics can mop up and you've left no prosthetic material. I think this could potentially be a game changer. We don't use it on the left side frequently. Um, I'd say Mike's experience, you know, I just wanted to show you this one slide here. Um, we've done a number of patients in this past few years. Um, if on, if on, they have an indication for surgery and they have surgery, these are IV drug user patients who have endocarditis, their mortality is reasonable at 25%. Uh, it's, this is not really not a surgical mortality. It's mostly from uh, recurrent use, um, uh, recurrent sepsis and overdose. But if they have an indication for surgery and they undergo medicine, their mortality is about 50-50. So we try to operate as much as possible. If they don't have an indication, well, of course, no one goes for surgery. If they don't have an indication for surgery and they have medical therapy, 0% mortality is actually quite well. You can clean up the bacteria are cleaning up the vegetation with antibiotics alone. Um, and this is just the patients that we've sort of um, operated and had medical therapy on. Uh, oh, these are our patients with an indication who've undergone medical or surgical uh, procedures. Um, you know, they, they are a high risk cohort primarily because of their uh, addiction. Uh, they can get through surgery, but the addiction is the challenge. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. Many of, of Many of those have been addressed or are, are, are being thought of by Tommy and Dr. Fedoric and Dr. Adams and others. Um, lots of interesting questions and the optimal care of this high risk but very worthy patient population. So just, uh, just a brief uh, summary. Uh, the surgical indications are primarily heart failure, recurrent embolism, large vegetation abscess and persistent infection. We will go to the operating room, remove all the materials and reconstruct what we need to. Most valves, at least in my hands, have been destroyed and necessitate complete replacement. I've repaired very few. And the multidisciplinary team-based approach I have found thus far to be, uh, as in every other field, the optimal way to treat patients. And that's why we're so excited to have this chat with you folks today. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Stop share. So perhaps um, there are any questions for Dr. Fedoric or myself about these? Maybe Tommy, do you want to um, facilitate the questions there? Yeah, I'd be happy to um, facilitate questions. Thanks very much, uh, Bobby and Lynn, for your presentations. 
I think uh, we haven't really in this series so far gotten into much about the pathophysiology and the medical and obviously surgical treatments of endocarditis. So it's really helpful to get a deep dive on what, what sorts of, of decisions you have to make. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite as simple as uh, one of the internists coming by and saying, we think you should operate. Um, so for people who have questions about uh, the presentation today or anything to do with cardiac surgery, for, for people who inject drugs with endocarditis, feel free to raise your hand using the reaction button, uh, type it into the chat box, or just unmute yourself. Um, I, I could start us off, I suppose. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, particularly the question of repeat surgeries seems to be one that's like very complex and can become quite emotionally charged um, at our institution. I was wondering what, what sorts of um, pieces of clinical information, uh, what other pieces of information do you take into account and how do you go about a decision-making process um, in terms of offering repeat surgery for people who have had recurrent endocarditis? Um, you know, it, as it, it's a highly, highly charged question. The older school, i.e. myself with the gray hair, um, <laughs> has gone through the process of, well, we'll offer it to them once. But if they continue to inject and show up with an infection of their prosthetic material, we're not doing it again. So some of my colleagues in the past have had written contracts with people. Of course, they're not binding, but they've made them sign a contract to say that this was the case. So this is why it is so important to make this a multidisciplinary uh, team. You know, the addiction is the problem. Endocarditis is just a symptom of the problem. And so if we take a look at somebody who has another medical issue and we treat symptoms, but then the problem continues, do we retreat the symptoms? Often not. At some point they become palliative, right? So is, is it the fact that this is just a younger patient population that makes us think that, that we should keep going? Is it the fact that maybe they'll turn it around? I, this is why there is such an ethical debate among surgeons. I mean, surgeons in general are very pragmatic and we're not very good at societal, social, ethical stuff. It's like we either operate or we don't. Uh, would you agree with that, Bobby? Yeah, I completely agree. You know, uh, a bad addiction is like akin to metastatic cancer. You know, it's that bad. Is that is that challenging? Um, so I completely agree with Dr. Fedorik. Um, I, I I tell patients who are IV drug users that this is their only chance. Um, but uh, but I have operated uh, uh, on two patients. Uh, one who had an infection that was completely unrelated to the addiction. So they were following up with addictions. They were doing a great job. They turned their life around, and they got us. An, an, an infection, a GI infection, unre presumably unrelated to their addiction and offer that patient a reoperation uh, because that was the fair thing to do. And I operate on another patient who um, did get a recurrent infection from the addictions, but was really, really like going to every single meeting of uh, that he was having with the addiction specialist was really trying and the addiction specialist felt that of all the patients that she had seen, this is the patient that would make it. She really asked me to take them back. I did, and we shall see what happens. So, you know, it's case by case by case. And, um, you know, I, I'm perhaps younger-ish. I try to give people a chance, um, but, um, you know, uh, you know, it's case by case. And, and in each surgeon has to decide for themselves what they feel comfortable with. We don't do things that are futile, um, but that, that, that's a gray area. And I think each person has to decide what they feel comfortable doing. Now, I think that the key word in what you just said is futile, right? Hmm. Somebody has to convince me that it's not futile. Yeah. And then it's okay, we'll go for it. Yeah. But that's, 
you know, unfortunately difficult in this patient population. You know, as, as far as multidisciplinary teams are concerned, I think that Lisa, there's just a couple of questions in the chat and then we'll get to the hands. Uh, Lisa asked what the funding for multidisciplinary disciplinary teams is. Well, that's a very difficult thing. I mean, I've been trying to advocate for that here for a while. The, um, I think the key is actually to go the nurse practitioner route and use them as the hub of a hub and spoke model and have patients that have been operated on for in, uh, infective endocarditis who also use drugs, have them as their sort of buddy as, as AA does, right? Somebody that they check in with weekly or that kind of process, right? The, there is no specific way to look at the funding model for this. It's a, it's a societal issue. And I don't know what it's like, you know, every province is different, but BC is throwing money in the wrong places as far as I'm concerned. You know, would we not operate on mul for multiple times on someone who has recurrences of cancer? Well, well, what my point was that if a patient had metastatic cancer, often we would not offer certain therapies because they are sort of more on the palliative side. That was my point. Um, um, I, I'm not a cancer specialist, so, but but I guess what what uh, Dr. Fedog brought up this uh, this idea of futility and uh, it is important. The other the other piece of it is is that often when you're going first of all when you go in for redo surgery it's a it's a much more complex situation. Yeah. Secondly, if they've got a a, a bioprosthetic valve in there and there's destruction of tissue around the bioprosthetic valve there are times where you truly do not get those patients out of the operating room because you have nothing to sew to. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the picture that I showed you of the, the abscess around the aorta where there was a, I picked the biggest aortic root abscess I've ever seen to, to show you guys just because you, so you could get an appreciation of it. And there was nothing to sew to there. I ended up actually using the mitral valve as the base of the aortic valve and running, it was just a mess and the patient never got out of the operating room. So there's, there's also that futility in the sense that if you don't have, if there's been so much tissue destruction that when, we, when you remove the infection, there's nothing to sew to, there's nothing to do. I appreciate you both uh, being so candid and open about your reasoning here and sharing some of the complexity with us. And uh, particularly the importance of multidisciplinary teams in coming to these, you know, comprehensive assessments and decisions. I guess I just want to challenge the, I'm going to invite David Sorota to ask his question in one second, but I just want to challenge the framing of the metastatic cancer a bit, um, because I think what we've seen at our institution is, uh, you know, we're so far from being able to offer everything that might reduce risk of recurrence. Um, and so there's a long way to go between what is being offered at many institutions and what would be kind of the gold standard best practice in terms of like, you know, offering evidence-based comprehensive addiction treatment, full spectrum harm reduction services, supportive housing, income support, all these things that might reduce recurrence. I think the, the phenotype or the natural history of different metastatic cancers is really, can be really well described a lot of the time. And so expectations can be clear, but for people who inject drugs, uh, the, the question of futility um, you know, might have many different definitions depending on your perspective and, and what sorts of things we have access to. Uh, but I appreciate I'm not answering the question. I'm just kind of highlighting the more of the complexity uh, with a bit of a different framing. I mean, and I, I've, I'm not an expert in uh, addictions by any means, but, um, but I've seen a lot of patients and I, I have a sort of more feeling that uh, this is just a total amateur, but uh, addiction is a social disease. So if I take someone off the street and I fix them up and then send them back to the street with no job, no housing, no friends, no social supports. You know, uh, how can I expect someone to be drug free? I mean, they have nothing to live for. I have to give, you have to give someone, someone something to live for, a job that provides them uh, pride for as being a person, social supports, friends, people that actually care about them. I mean, I literally have some patients who not a single person in the world cares about them. That's a very different situation. It's hard to imagine. Um, so we actually have a social worker. We provide housing now. Uh, we give some money for food. We try and, and set, because the social part of it is so important. Uh, this is uh, something, but all of this costs money. 
uh, and it's money that we don't really have. We're trying, but um, we're, you know, I'm setting them up to lose and I want to set them up to win. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Lynn, do you, have, do you want to respond to that or should I move on to uh, the next Let's question? Just... I'll respond later. Let's get to the other. Okay, questions. great. And David, you want to take yourself off mute there? I'll just share a link to David's paper as well on, on treating the symptom and not the underlying disease, which we share with our learners. And I really appreciate. Thanks, Tommy. I'm, uh, I'm an infectious disease and addiction doctor in Miami, Florida. It's really, really refreshing to hear your perspectives, uh, Dr. Yanagawa and Dr. Dr. Fedoric. I feel like maybe just where I've trained, I have not heard such a understanding and sort of compassionate uh, outlook from our cardiac surgery colleagues. And so it's really great to hear that y'all are doing this up in Canada. Um, I think my bias uh, is that I want to avoid surgery at all costs whenever possible in this population. I think we know, you know, even given the best addiction treatment, assuming someone wants treatment for their addiction, that I think as was stated in the chat window, it's a you know, relapsing condition and you know, oftentimes people will return to use. And as you guys know, it can be a lot worse if you have a prosthetic valve in place and the risk of recurrent endocarditis. I think the um, area where I feel least comfortable or sort of have the most indecision about when surgery is indicated is in the setting of vegetation size and emboli. Um, I know a lot of data, at least specific to cerebral emboli, that like within a week of starting antibiotics, the rate drops precipitously. And I think there's some data for sort of other systemic emboli. And so I feel like I get into this kind of Goldilocks, trying to find the Goldilocks situation where I'm trying to like hold off on pushing surgery as long as possible to give them those days of antibiotics to whatever stabilize the vegetation or whatever is going on biomedically. Um, because I feel like I have not seen like emboli very late, you know, let's say after a week or two weeks. Um, but I was just wondering how you approach that when that when when vegetation size and and potential for emboli is sort of the main indication that you're looking at? So there's, there's been a couple of papers out that have shown that vegetation is greater than one centimeter in the mitral position, especially if the organism is staph aureus, have a significantly higher mortality associated with it without operation. So that is the one driving paper for sort of going after veggie size. And when, when you, if you actually, when we operate on people for tissue destruction, which is the main surgical indication, you'll be amazed at the stuff that's in there that is so friable and so shreddable that it's, it's amazing that it all hasn't let go, mm -hmm. right? So, so in general, I try and hold off of operating on veg, like everybody's like, oh, it's big, it's big. And then it gets bigger. And the reason that the vegetations get bigger isn't that there's still bacteria there that's growing, it's that they become uh, enhanced with platelet aggregation. And it's the platelet aggregation that actually increases the size of the vegetation after the antibiotics have become effective, not bacterial growth. And that's something that people have to keep in mind. Yeah, in terms of vegetation, um, uh, Size is important and one, one centimeter we consider it to be quite large. Um, in terms of location on the anterior mitral leaflet, which has a huge excursion compared to the posterior, more likely to embolize, uh, also compared to on the aortic valve leaflets. Um, and then um, also the, the, the organism. So strep has a chance of clearance with antibiotics, staph less so, fungal less so. Um, and uh, you're right that there's actually, I, I find that in the first day or two, there's a little bit of an increased risk of embolism because that sort of biofilm gets dislodged by the antibiotics. But after a few days, certainly after a week, the risk of uh, recurrent embolism is much, much lower. Um, and, uh, and so if you do have recurrent embolism, despite a week or two of antibiotics, they're continually showering to their brain or kidneys, then uh, that is an indication for surgery. And how, how long do uh, do you kind of tell people like that bioprosthetic valve will last? Because that's a, the other thing is it's like how many surgeries should a 25-year-old be expecting to need if they get a valve replacement? 
You know, David, I think the answer to that is it's not how long will the bioprosthetic valve last? It's do they have the ability to take Coumadin and monitor it? Now, once the PROAC trial is in, which will be a couple of years, and we can put people on probably a Pixaban as opposed to Warfarin for uh, anticoagulation, then everybody should probably be getting a mechanical valve. The issue that I have right now is you have a patient population that unfortunately can be unreliable with respect to taking medications. And if that's the case, especially a mechanical valve in the mitral position, that's a dangerous situation. So as, as much as a mitral valve in the, sorry, a tissue valve in the mitral position um, doesn't last as long, that's probably the first step. And then if it wears out in five years and they're back and they've had the opportunity to become more consistent with their, their medical therapy, that's when you, you talk to them about the mechanical valve. And that's a huge win. I mean, if you get a young, young patient who has cleared their addiction, who now has, and now has prosthetic valve disease five years out and you can put a mechanical valve in that's a that's a fist in the air and that's an incredible win so i'd be very happy to do that reoperation and they may do very well for the long term midterm long term thank you i think carlin had their hand up uh, next carlin if you want to unmute and and bring up the next question hi um Thank you for everything so far. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, um, so I'm a nurse uh, working in Vancouver at a hospital medical unit, um, primarily infectious disease. So we see a lot of um, folks who use substances and this conversation um, comes up. Um, and I, I find I hear still often a lot, just um, not a surgical candidate, um, sort of flat out um, with not a ton of explanation. And then a seemingly, from my perspective, and a seemingly arbitrary period of required abstinence to even consider um, re-engaging with um, the cardiac surgery team. And, and, they, and I don't know if you can speak at all to if there's any, any thoughts around um, an appropriate timing for that. It, it just, it gets frustrating because it feels like I said, very arbitrary. Um, you know, abstinent for this many months or, or whatnot. And then I also wondered if there's been talk around, um, and maybe this isn't a viable option, but for, for patients who are open to maybe um, switching to inhalation of substances as a harm reduction tool, um, if, if that is something um, that surgeons would ever consider sort of as a safer option to prevent recurrence of infection. Well, it definitely would be a, a safer option for recurrence of infection, right? Any, any, anything that prevents bacteremia is important, period, end of statement. And that's, that's kind of the key to this, right? As far as your, your comment about not a surgical candidate, uh, simply because they're, they use drugs, um, that's to me an inappropriate statement. Yeah. There, are, there are indications for surgery. There are contraindications for surgery. Um, certainly, I think everybody has the opportunity for a procedure that is life-saving. The question becomes do, the second chance or the third chance or the fourth chance. And, and, I, and I think that's you know, kind of the, the issue that people struggle with. Uh, I don't know how else to, to put it. Bobby? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's, it's an interesting point. So we don't know. The answer is we don't know. And we're all trying to sort of find, think on our own mind, what is reasonable or rational. So I don't require any kind of duration of abstinence. I do, however, require at the very minimum that a patient says that they will try to, to be abstinent. And, and I have had patients that say, no, I just, there's no, I'm, they're sick. And they say, there's no way they will ever stop using IV drugs. There's just no possible way of how to meet with addiction specialists and the like. And I tell them, then I, I simply cannot operate on you because there, there is some degree of futility. Um, and that's infrequent. Most patients will say, listen, I'm going to give it 
a college try. I'm going to do everything possible. And if you're going to try, then I will work with you. So I'm pretty liberal. I probably operate on the most uh, injection drug users in our city um, uh, because, um, because I feel that people should get a chance. Um, but we just don't know. Um, and there we need maybe help from our addiction specialists. We're just heart surgeons. We need the help of, uh, of you all who are the experts in the addictions area and we wanna work with you. Thank you. You know, and I, I, I think this is, you know, as I said at the beginning, it's a societal issue. It's a multidisciplinary team issue. We just, as surgeons, you need to do something that has a chance for success. You, you, you can't perform a procedure that's futile. That it doesn't matter what, what you're doing in life, you don't do things that are futile. And so you just have to, have to understand that it's, we're, we're not trying to be gatekeepers per se, at least I'm not, maybe some of my colleagues are and I'm unaware of it, but I, I just can't do something that's futile. I can't, it just, it doesn't make sense to me. Now, maybe my definition of futility is different than somebody else's. And that's where the debate comes in, mm -hmm. right? And so this is why, you know, this is, this is why this, like I said to you at the very beginning of my talk, this is how this whole process started two years ago with Corey and I talking about all of this. And, and there are definitely people in, our, in the cardiac surgery community that will never operate on somebody that uses drugs who has endocarditis, mm -hmm. period, end of statement. And I personally, I think that's abhorrent. But there are also people in our community that will operate on people four, five, and six times. And that's honorable in their eyes. I, I don't know. There's, there's a point of futility that comes. When, when, when you leave somebody behind on the operating room table, it takes a piece of your soul. Mm. And you just, it's hard to go there. And that, that futility is such that everybody's just got a different level of it. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. Uh, I see someone in the chat, a young lady, maybe Maria, she has some I, thoughts and maybe had objected to something I said. Maybe uh, if you have any comments, I'm happy to address them. That's okay. Anyway, we're trying the best we can. You know, none of us have all the right answers here. Uh, we're, we're trying to do the right thing as uh, Dr. Um, uh, Fedoric had mentioned, but we don't, we don't have the answers. Not all of them anyway. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it, it, the, a lot of the challenge uh, and tension may come in uh, the different definitions of futility as Lynn was mentioning and, you know, not understanding what, what may happen next. Um, to somebody with one of these infections. I, I do wanna invite Vic to ask the next question. Um, sure. But I think Lynn may have to go to the operating room as well right now. Do you have time for one more question, Lynn, or do you need to go? One more. Okay, Vic, <laughs> you wanna speak now? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'm an ID and an addictions doctor also in uh, Vancouver. And I, I guess my, my question is twofold. I mean, first of all, you know, thank you for speaking today. Um, you know, one of the things I'm wondering is how we as ID doctors or addiction doctors or internists or, you know, allied health colleagues can best advocate for patients who would otherwise meet criteria for surgical intervention, especially in those cases where it's, it's not being offered, um, you know, simply because of, of substance use, um, and particularly perhaps when we have differing definitions of, you know, what is futility. Um, and then the second question, um, which you know, some other folks who are here may be able to speak to is, you know, to what extent do we consider what um, risk if any patients are, are willing and, um, you know, able to accept because, you know, certainly folks are autonomous and, and I, I would suggest that most folks are able to kind of appreciate the risks of, of surgical intervention if it is, um, you know, required um, and be able to, you know, as patients make those decisions for, for themselves and to what extent does that factor into things? Just to answer the first question, if, if if you get a surgical opinion that says that they're not willing to operate, get a second opinion. Yeah, that's reasonable. 
if 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 you have two surgeons who are adamantly opposed to operating for a specific reason other than just they're an IV, IV drug user or a drug user or but if they've got a specific reason as to not then all, it it might be the appropriate way to go but if if you if you've got the first person saying well i i just don't want to use, operate on somebody who uses drugs we'll get a second opinion because and 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 this is going to sound silly but get your second opinion from a younger surgeon <laughs> yeah it's, i think that's true and but but i must and, say and, you know and, and, and that's 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 a bias that i see my my i mean i'm i'm now one of the older colleagues in in canada unfortunately um but my group tends to be more conservative in their in their therapy options than than the younger groups um it's 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 an unfortunate failing it's a way we were i don't know it's just it's the difference in the times right uh i'm i guess i have to leave the operating room has been bugging me for about 10 minutes i do apologize profoundly thanks so thanks much Lynn. thanks so much lynn um, I guess I'll just answer that last question and then I better go too. I got a lineup of patients waiting for me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, I completely agree with Dr. Fedoric. Like any other high risk patient, uh, surgeons have some uh, degree of uh, willingness to operate and some are not because of high risk or other reasons. I know a lot of, I know most surgeons across the country, they're very reasonable. Uh, we've been trained almost the same way. We think pretty similarly. I don't know of any surgeons that say, I don't know of a single surgeon that says flat out, I will never operate on a drug user. I've never heard that before. Most people are quite thoughtful and uh, really consider the clinical uh, situation carefully. Um, so, uh, but, but get a second opinion and maybe someone younger, you know. Thanks, and, and the other thing is I listen a lot to our ID specialists and our infectious and, and our addiction specialist a lot. If my addiction specialists say this person has a chance, then I'm going to take them to the operating room. And if then if my addiction specialists say no matter what we've tried for six months or a year, we simply cannot get this fella off the, the regularly off the drugs, then I, I will hesitate. But I, I, you know, like any other specialist, I listen to my specialists um uh, and whatever they say i i take as um i really consider their advice thanks very much bobby i um next week's session uh in the seminar series is about this aspect of multidisciplinary teams for making decisions about treatments and surgery and that kind of thing so i hope folks will be able to attend that discussion and bring up some of these issues as well um because obviously you know there's questions like rights of, of people who use drugs and uh, risks and benefits of the operation itself. And Lynn brought up the idea of when the surgery itself is, is potentially too risky um, and those kinds of things. So I hope we can get into some of these discussions next week as well. Uh, we're going to have representatives at, from teams at least at McMaster and at Boston Medical Center. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Bobby, for joining us today. Uh, and thanks. I think he's gone to the operating room now. Thanks, everyone, for joining. This recording will be uh, up on the YouTube page as well. And looking forward to seeing everybody, whoever can make it next week for our discussion about multidisciplinary teams. Thank you all.